Hello, and welcome to a five-minute learning burst on allyship in the workplace. I am Dr. Arante Bennett, Associate Professor of Marketing in Villanova's School of Business. When I am not in the classroom, I also serve as a faculty director in our Office of Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion, or ODEI. Though there are many ways to approach this work, today we'll be taking the path that comes through allyship. If you're like most of the people I've spoken to in the last few months, you've heard this word bandied about, but are not quite sure what it means. So let's start there, laying the foundation of our conversation by defining the focal term, allyship. According to Cornell F. Woodson, Associate Director for Diversity and Inclusion at Cornell University, allyship is an active and consistent practice of deconstructing and challenging one's beliefs and actions in which a person seeks to work in solidarity with a marginalized individual or group of people. Allyship takes effort, effort over time, and effort intended to support other people or groups of people. That said, if allyship is so effortful, why even bother to engage? Using your own position of power or privilege to elevate your colleagues is key to fostering not only diverse, but truly inclusive workplaces. And every single piece of research points toward the value, not just in terms of culture, but also on the bottom line that stems directly from diverse and inclusive teams. Are you wondering if you're qualified to be an ally? The answer is unequivocally yes. Anyone, absolutely anyone can be an ally. Workplace allies are people who are willing to personally align themselves with colleagues to make sure they're heard and included. Now, let's take a step back and turn our attention to the role of our social identities and how they interact with allyship. The University of Michigan created a simple exercise, the social identity wheel, to help us reflect on these concepts. The first step in the process is to consider our own identity. Race, gender, first language, nation of origin, social economic status, religion, and a few others. And then we are asked to reflect on those that we think of the most and the least. Press pause for just one second and think about it. Which aspects of your identity are regularly at the fore which are often in the background. The next step of the exercise is to consider which aspects of ourselves have the strongest impact on our self-perception, and then on how we are perceived by others. Press pause again and chew on those questions. In some situations, our identities will be such that we are in a position to come to the aid of others. In other situations, we will need them to come to our aid. Identity is essential in our understanding of allyship. One's identity has a direct correlation to when they may need an ally versus when they can be an ally. It's only through understanding our identity and that of others that we can begin to empathize with their experiences. Using identity as a starting point permits us to understand the role of power and privilege, recognizing the social identities that are often given voice and those that are regularly silenced. When we begin to understand the power dynamics associated with identity, we are then able to call out oppressions that stem from them. These oppressions do not have to be overt nor intentional. That does not mean that they are not harmful to others. Lastly, a robust understanding of identity enables us to stand in solidarity with our colleagues. I'd like to leave you with some actionable steps toward being an ally at work. First, listen with respect, understanding, and a willingness to learn. Listening and apologizing are powerful in a workplace context, laying a strong foundation of civility. Second, draw attention to colleagues' contributions. When you're in a room and someone takes credit for the work of a silenced colleague, be sure the credit is appropriately attributed. Third, use your network and social capital to recommend marginalized colleagues. Wield your power to make introductions or suggestions that can benefit deserving employees 
who would have otherwise stayed marginalized. Fourth, actively confront bad behavior. Depending on your position within the organization, use one or a combination of the five Ds. Document, delegate, delay, distract, and directly intervene when you see inappropriate behavior. And fifth, encourage others to be allies. As I close, I want to remind you that at some point, we will all need an ally, just as we will be able to serve as one. Thank you.